everybody. Um, today I am going to be reading the first chapter of my novel Poisoning the Nest. The prologue is already on the site and I'll pop a card up so that you can listen to that before you listen to this if you haven't heard it already. So this is chapter one of Poisoning the Nest by Nestle Muller. Sitting in the back of his cab, Archibald Kelly was grateful for the elasticity of his conscience. Not that he had been in danger of stretching it out of shape in the past few years, but knowing of its elastic proportions was of, a, was of use at times like this. He had not sought out Sally Jenkins. She had hired his cab. It was she, not him, who suggested he sit with her in the cab as the storm that had been lowering over the town all afternoon broke. It was she who, seeing his unusually subdued mood, had offered to, in her own terms, cheer him up. He had not resisted when Sally, with the adroitness of her profession, opened his flies and took him in her mouth. In all honesty, he was on the receiving end of an act of charity. It would be selfish and ungrateful to deny the Sally the chance to help the needy. At most, he was guilty of a sinful act, but not with his full consent, a lesser offence than if it had been premeditated. A few Hail Marys and a couple of extra shillings on the plate on Sunday would clean it away. Outside the cab, the horses shook in their harness, sending a tremor through the cab. A similar tre tremor shook its driver. Sally shifted her position, lying against Archer's chest, her head rising and falling with his breathing. When was the last time we did this, Arch? Looking at Sally, Arch brushed her disordered hair out of her face. Her hair was dry and brittle, a casualty of her carelessness with curling tongs. Must be about five years. Shifting to lie propped up on her forearms, Sally picked something off the tip of her tongue. Yeah, I got sick of picking your red hairs out of me teeth. Is that why we stopped? Listening to the rain drumming on the roof of the cab, Arch closed his eyes and pushed the memories Sally's words revived back into the shadows. That, and you went off and became respectable. Clearly wishing to indulge in the luxur luxury of nostalgia, Sally's words continued, oblivious to Arch's disinterested coolness. You are pretty wild back then. I once thought you wanted to marry me. Arch stirred beneath the weight of Sally's body, trying to shake off the numbness that had settled on his limbs. You wouldn't have married me if I'd asked. Sally narrowed her eyes, giving Arch a look of exacting frankness, the softness of nostalgia evaporating as the toughness of her profession reasserted itself. You wouldn't have asked because we didn't love each other. Besides, neither of us are the marrying type. I've always been fond of you. Arch ran his... He... Arch ran the backs of his fingers down the side of Sally's face, smudging her face powder. Yes, I know. I'm your favourite tart. Sally pushed herself up and brushed Arch's legs off the seat, settling herself in their place. Fumbling in her handbag, Sally reapplied her lipstick, using the cab window for a mirror. Outside, the rain had stopped. The only drops to be felt now were those falling like fat tears from the leaves of the tree they had parked beneath. Pulling himself up into a seated position, Arch rearranged himself, tucking his shirt tails into his trousers. Sally watched as he pulled a comb from his pocket and tidied his hair, setting his hat carefully on top. Watching Arch transform, settling his face into the visage of a good bloke, the man about town, Sally felt the urge to delay the change, to say one last thing before they both became their public selves again. I was really sorry to hear about your dad. Thanks. Arch ran his fingers over his moustache and goatee beard, flashing Sally a tight, sad smile as he turned away. Opening the door, Arch stepped out of the cab with all the fastidiousness of a girl as he sought to keep his boots clear of the mud. Climbing back into the driver's seat, he signalled to his horses and set the cab back on the road. Stepping into the kitchen, Doddy Kelly flicked the switch of the electric light in a movement that was rapidly becoming second nature. Picking potatoes out of the bin under the sink, she began to wash and peel them, marvelling at how much easier the job had become now that she was free from the kerosene lighting of their previous home. 
Still, that home had its charms, not the least of which was that it was not her husband's childhood home, or the fact that it had not required significant repairs to bring it into the 20th century. This house had eaten the whole of the deposit she and Jack had saved for the house of their, of their own. They had envisioned a rather grander house than old Pat Kelly's little weatherboard house up on Bathurst Road. Jack had fancied something more in the line, more in line with the big brick houses with their rambling gardens one sees in Lura, though they both knew that Jack's budget would not stretch that far, not before he made solicitor at least. They had got the repairs done cheap thanks to Dottie's uncle Alfred, recently arrived from Mudgee with her aunt Martha and daughter Mary. Her mother Lottie always said that Martha's husband Alfred was the family's social experiment, marrying down albeit not too many rungs, while Lottie herself represented the other greatest experiment, marrying Irish. Placing her pan of potatoes on the heat, Dottie was glad that their budget had stretched to a new stove. There were some things that she would not countenance, and cooking on a poor stove was one of them. Cleaning away the baby's dinner, Lottie laid the table for three, as it, as it was a certainty that Jack would bring his brother Arch home. It had become a habit since their father's death to eat an evening meal together, establishing a ritual that would never have been possible when their father was alive. Jack had escaped the family home into marriage almost as soon as she, a few months younger than him, had turned 18. Their third anniversary was coming up in a matter of weeks. As for Arch, she knew he had a wild streak. One could not grow up in a town this small and not know that, though he kept it hidden fairly well. They would be down at the billiards hall now, playing a game to avoid coming home to this house. Even with most of the old furniture gone, Arch had claimed much of it for his cottage by the stables. The house still didn't feel like theirs. Already three months in and over £50 worth of renovations, she and Jack had begun talking of selling it. She'd already, he had already escaped it twice, first to go to school in Parramatta, living with his aunt, and then later upon his return into marriage. Now he was back again, his father's death pulling him backwards into a home he had thought he'd left behind. The back bedroom that had once been his, she noted, he had so far refused to enter. That is, that it had become a guest room for the moment, allowing his refusal to be explainable, logical. Why enter an empty room? But Dossie had seen enough of his behaviour in this house to know it was more than convenience or lack of need that made Jack's eyes slide quickly past the door. She had seen the mortified look on his face when Arch told him the house was his. In the front room, the clock chimed the half hour. Opening up the icebox, Dottie took out the pork chops she had bought for, the dinner, for dinner. Placing them into the hot skillet, she turned to the pantry and took out a jar of sauerkraut and another of applesauce. Returning to the stove, Dottie drained the potatoes and began to mash them, whisking in butter and cream. Turning the meat, she put the kettle back on the heat to make a fresh pot for the dinner table. As she was taking the dinner plates from the plate warmer, Dottie heard the sound of footsteps on the front ver veranda. By the time the footsteps and the bodies that belonged to them reached the kitchen door, dinner lay on the table. Looking up at her husband standing by the door, Dottie could see the flush of the cold walk home still upon his cheeks. She liked seeing him like this, full of animal health and vitality, forgetful of the worries and cares that burdened him of late. In the electric light, his green eyes glittered. Crossing the room, Jack bent down and kissed Dottie on the cheek, a cool greeting for all its intimacy, and nothing like the types of kisses they'd shared only a few months earlier. Taking his seat at the table, Jack reached for the salt. Silently, Dottie and Arch joined him. Did you have a good game? said Dottie, to no one in particular. He took three shillings off me, said Arch, gesturing towards his brother with the knife. Really? I'll have one of them said Doddy as Jack fished in his pocket for the shiny silver coin. Are the children asleep? Jack tossed off his word, tossed off the words he knew were expected of him, focusing his attention on the plate of food before him. Yes, they both went down about six. Doddy put the silver coin into the kitty which stood on the table beside the teapot. Listening to Doddy's words, Jack nodded. He ate quickly, slicing the meat with unnecessary ferocity. Loading his fork with meat and mashed potato, he filled his mouth from neither from neither greed nor pleasure, but for the silence with, within which eating allowed him to shroud himself. How was your day, Arch? That big storm just came just as the Sunday train came into the station. 
It was fierce. Even with me coat, I got soaked going down to the guest houses. The tips were good, but it took me all afternoon to dry out, said Arch, gesturing as wildly with his knife and fork, as if his hands were free. Have you got football this weekend, Jack? Every Saturday in winter, for the first two years that she had known him, Dottie had stood in the cold watching Jack play rugby, his fine muscular legs in their long socks and his shock of ginger hair making him unmissable on the field. Among the under-21s, Jack had been the source of much female admiration. Dottie was herself the source of much envy, as breathless with victory, Jack would appear at the barrier and kiss her with more enthusiasm than society allowed. Next year, when Alfrey was older, was older, she would be back at the barrier watching the game, encouraging the children to cheer their father on as he chased and tackled grown men into the mud over possession of a leather ball. It was completely stupid and utterly futile, but at least it would be a return to normality. No, we got knocked out by Lithgow last week. If you're free, I'm going down to Aunt Bet's to pick up my new cab. Do you want to come? I'll think about it said Jack, buttering a slice of bread. Finishing his dinner, Jack pushed his plate aside and rose from the seat. Where's the paper? In the front room, on the tea table, said Doddy, laying down her knife and fork. Would you like me to bring you tea? Jack frowned and turned away, leaving the room. Doddy listened to his footsteps along the hall and the sound of the front room door being shut. Doddy looked down at her plate. He'll be right, Dot, said Arch, resuming his meal. It's the shock of everything. We didn't expect Dad to go just like that. No, of course not. Chewing through silence, Arch looked at Dottie. Never since Arch had known her had Dottie actually looked so young, or is always possessed of a confidence and self-assurance which had made her seem so much older than her years. Stripped of that by Jack's behaviour, sitting with her head bowed over her dinner, she appeared for the first time as she actually was, a girl disappointed and frustrated in her desires. The image of married life that had seduced Dottie and his brother had begun to crumble as hard reality began to press in on them, revealing them more as children playing house than responsible adults. Pushing his empty plate away from himself, Arch broke the silence. As a lovely dinner, Dot. You don't mind if I go out and have a smoke? Be my guest, said Dottie, clearing away the dinner plates. Pulling his boots on, Arch stepped out onto the back veranda and lit his pipe. The cool night air was a shock after the warmth of the house. Looking, looking at the darkening garden, he could tell where every shrub, tree and flower bed was with his eyes closed. He knew where the daffodils would emerge as they had every spring, thicker than the year before, as they multiplied silently and stealthily beneath the lawn. He used to pick them as a boy, filling his arms with golden faces to present to his mother, and she would smile down at him from a face so like his brother's, wreathed in coppery gold, placing his offering in the crystal vase she had been given as a wedding present. Arch sighed, blowing a stream of smoke towards the daffodil bed. He wasn't sure if there was a word for how he was feeling, how he had been feeling for months. Sad was too strong a word. He wasn't sad, perhaps melancholy but that sounded too posh a word to attach to himself. It was the kind of word Jack would use. Perhaps it would be best expressed in one of those guttural German words Dottie occasionally came out with. Weltschmerz. He thought of the way she looked when she came out with these words. Her eyes would narrow and she would draw her chin towards herself. Her lips would curl, making her look like a small terrier. Then from the depths of her throat would come this strange barking language. She didn't know many German words, just ones that seemed to have no translation in English, as if her Teutonic blood felt more than could be expressed in her native tongue. Whatever the word or what he felt was, it was damned unpleasant to feel. Mind if I join you? Jack stepped out onto the veranda. Reaching into his jacket pocket, he pulled out a cigarette case and slipped a ready-rolled cigarette between his lips, tucking the silver case away in his pocket in a practice move. Arch looked up at the clear night sky, which showed no hint of the afternoon storm. It'll be another fine day tomorrow, another day of carting tourists up and down Katoomba Street to see the sights. It was shaping up to be a good season. Lots of tourists, fine weather, punctuated by the odd storm to send them scurrying for cabs. I miss living here with Dad, you know, said Arch, watching as Jack lit his cigarette, the engraved silver lighter a wedding present from his father-in-law. 
Try as he might, Jack struggled to remember anything positive about the house. For him, it had always been the sight of raised voices, broken objects and dodged blows. The idea that he and Dossie were expected to live and raise their family here, a place where family had never existed, baffled him. He thought vaguely of the block of land with a view of the valley Aunt Betty had bought for them. The house they wanted, the house they had been saving to build, seemed further off than ever. Jack drew on his cigarette, exhaling the smoke in a long, steady stream. When is that new cab you've been boasting about arriving? I'm going down to Parramatta to pick it up from Aunt Bet Friday evening. I'll spend Saturday visiting with her, drive it back up Sunday. Do you know how to drive it? Of course I do, you cheeky bastard. So, do you want to come with me? Yeah, that'd be good, said Jack as his brother turned, entering the kitchen. Sitting back down on the step, Jack finished his cigarette. Another six months, a year at most, and it would not seem indecent to sell, to get away. Jack would never forgive him for... Arch would never forgive him for selling the house. He could rent it out. Jack fiddled with the lighter in his pocket. Taking it out, he watched the frail faint flame flicker in the evening breeze. Burn it down. Burn the whole... Burn down the whole place like a pile of scrap wood and take the blame, the guilt and the fear with it. Closing the lighter with a sigh, Jack ground his cigarette beneath his shoe. Rising, he followed his brother back into the house. Long after Arch had gone home to his cottage by the stables on the other side of the railway tracks, Jack sat in his front room watching as the fire died down in the grate. Down the hall, he could hear Dossie climbing out of the bath. Any minute now, she would appear at the door telling him that the bath was free. Alfie was three months old now, yet it had been ages since he and Dottie had made love. It had been ages since he wanted to. The bath is free, said Dottie, peering into the dark front room. I'll be there in a minute. Stepping into the front room, Dottie pulled the towel from her head and began to rub her long, dark brown hair dry before the fire. Jack looked at Dottie bent over before him. Reaching out to lay his hand on the small of her back, Jack allowed his hand to follow the curve of her backside down to the edge of the towel and the bare thighs below. Feeling the hand against his leg, Dottie stopped drying her hair. Tossing the hair towel into the armchair opposite, brushing the damp strands away from her face. Removing his hand, Jack stood covering his confusion by rubbing his hands together. Can't let the water go cold. Jack, I'll wait for you. Looking at Dottie silhouetted against the dying fire, Jack shook his head. It's been a long day, love. I'm tired. If you would like to support this channel, come across to the Black Cocky Press website www.blackcockypress.com.au where you will find books and other materials to help with your writing.